Welcome to Managing Marketing. Today I'm sitting down with Peter Applebaum, who's the Managing Director of Tick Yes, and he's also the author of the book, Customer Romance, How to Build Your Brand One Customer at a Time. Welcome, Peter. Darren, thank you, great to be here. So I'm gonna say you are a direct marketer, and I hope you're not insulted by that. I'm complimented by that. That's, that's one of the highest compliments I could ever receive. I fell in love with direct marketing many, many years ago before there was such a thing as uh, the internet. And I used to go to the Australian Institute of Management Library up the road here in North Sydney, which I don't think is here anymore. It's in the city now. And um, I, was, I was an exciting guy. I used to read direct marketing books and, and just follow campaigns, particularly from the US, because here in Australia, we've never had that direct marketing ethos. No. I have it in the US because of the Sears Roebuck catalog, catalog the, the heritage of that from the 19th century that was set out with all the various products you could purchase. And Chicago was the center of That's that. It. Chicago That's was it. the great Midwest that would produce uh, retail catalogs and mail order catalogs. It was a real culture it was. of direct marketing and they had it down to a T, didn't they? And it, it, absolutely, because it was a decentralized uh, country back then, the US, which is obviously like Australia, it's completely changed. I mean, they have X, X, uh, probably a hundred capital cities or, or major cities, which where we had might have half a dozen. Whereas in the states, they, it was a far, they were farmers primarily in the nineteenth century. So the only way to get these new products was obviously the Sears Roebuck catalog. But you can understand why I said I hope you're not insulted because the word direct marketer seems to have disappeared since the internet age. Well, it actually was uh, back in the day before the internet age. It was the last century. That's when, it. When we were both practitioners of, uh, starting it. our careers. That's right. We were, we were mere boys there. Yeah. Um, it was it, people looked down on direct marketing here in Australia, at least. Uh, they think, well, advertising is the, the, the golden fleece. That's what you always want to go to, which, of course, I did as well. I was, a, I was a copywriter in advertising agencies. But that aside, I was always at heart, like my hero, David Ogilvie, who, who um, is a, was a legend advertising guy, but also loved direct marketing, um, recognized the value of creating those individual relationships and taking it forward from there on an ongoing basis. And that... That has been forgotten by many people, particularly because of what I mentioned before. We in here in Australia do not have that direct marketing foundation. So a lot of marketers and people making decisions about digital marketing, for example, or marketing overall, are doing so from a, a mass communication perspective without really understanding that digital gives us this amazing ability to create these one-to-one -one relationships and profit from them accordingly. Now, I may have uh, shared this with you previously, but uh, one of my heroes in direct marketing is Lester Wonderman. Right. And uh, in fact, I was in New York a few years ago. He, he actually passed away earlier this year, which is sad, but uh, I was in New York about three years ago and I, was, I caught up with David Sable, who's the CEO of uh, y in uh, New York or in the US. And he told me that then Lester was still coming into the office three days a week and I I said, you know, I'm, I'm just in awe of this man because back in the 60s, I think even late 50s, he was writing about the, the philosophy and the principles of direct marketing at a time when they used women in big pools typing yep. out personalised yep. letters. And I wanted to talk to him about how it felt to now live in an age where the technology had caught up with the principles, that all the things that he talked about, understanding the customer, giving them options, seeing which choices they made, gave you insight into them and so you could respond. And in the technology age, he could do that in real time. And I never got the chance because the day that I was meant to meet with him, he unfortunately called in ill. Oh. But it was one of, one of the, would have been one of the great opportunities. But I want to know your, your opinion because technology absolutely allows people to be able to direct market in real time and yet so few people seem to get it right why because they're they're looking at the wrong end of the telescope they're still like in the old days they're looking from the 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 small end out to the big end whereas in digital marketing and direct marketing done well it's the other way around we're looking from the big end right down to from big brand right down to the individual now that may sound impractical, 
if I've got 10 million customers, I'm a telco or a bank and I've got 10 million customers. But it's not. That's the beauty of technology. It's also the beauty of CRM, that where we can identify who that individual is. Now, of course, doing it, sending, and, and, and it doesn't, it, it's not exactly new technology to send an email that's been customized to my particular fears, needs, interests, wants, and desires. But that's how simple it can be from an email all the way through, obviously, programmatic. Everyone's talking about programmatic and all these sorts of things. It's just a, it's based a variation on a theme. And the theme is customize your marketing and customize your communication so I can better persuade you to buy what I'm selling as opposed to the other 10 people who are selling the same thing. So what you're saying is that the principles are exactly the same. The technology now allows you to scale that because what, you know, understand the individual communicate to them, yep. and then technology allows you to scale that approach Correct. to do hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of That's people. Right. It's a market of one times a million. So is it just laziness <clears throat> that makes people, for instance, you mentioned email, doing email blasts to millions of people that largely end up trapped in spam filters? The next option is, are they stuck in the old broadcast medium? I think it's a bit of a combination of all of, of what you've just said there. And I think there is there is a real knowledge gap with marketers, particularly in Australia, where we don't have that direct marketing foundation. Our leaders, the people who came before us, didn't really pass on their knowledge and, and the, the I guess, the power of creating those individual relationships. So there is a lot of broadcast media, the old-fashioned paradigm thinking when it comes to modern campaigns, campaigns today. You've got big brands who are spending millions of dollars on advertising, marketing, digital marketing, but doing it using the old way of thinking. They're not really focused on the individual. There's a lot of... There's, we, in, we in the marketing industry, as you know, we love these buzz phrases. We're always coming up with new buzz phrases. <laughs> I think it's one of the most creative parts of marketing. Exactly. Coming up with the latest term. Oh, look, I'm st- I'm, I'm, uh, I can still remember just running up the flagpole to see, see who salutes. salutes I, I see, I still, that's one of my favorites. One of the most ridiculous things you could ever say in a, in a professional context. But there's, there is no um, strategic foundation. And, I'm not, and you probably find this yourself when you speak to a lot of clients who are looking to engage with agencies and say strategy is what's it's what's missing mm. it's like i've got any number of organizations that can help me build a website do banner ads do do advertising online digital advertising campaigns or offline of course but coming up with a strategy that helps me to take this is my brand this is what it does and this is what it's, we're looking to achieve with the brand to really marry that with what consumers are looking for at the same time that's a real disconnect because guess what that's hard because rather than going to the facebook party or the google party and having the the reps come in and, and take them out for for lunch or, or to the pub pardon my cynicism but it's like it really comes down to if the best fun i think you can have in marketing is really to really understand drill down to that customer of one and multiply it by a thousand by hundred a thousand a million but it's interesting, isn't it? Because you mentioned before, you know, like the, the late 90s and even the early part of, you know, the first five years of this century, let's say. All of the talk from digital slash technology companies in marketing was about the ability to target individuals. It was all about one-to-one at scale. And then around 2005 to 2007, you know, and, and post the... Uh, the economic crash, mm-hmm. global economic yep. crash, suddenly it was all about almost like broadcast approach. Look at the millions of people you can reach through Facebook and Google. You know, it's scalability. Yep. It's about the low cost per thousand. You know, reach a million people and only pay X amount became the, the, the sort of, you know, the cry, the selling point about digital media. And yet... I wonder whether part of that's driven by the desire to need to make money. Because remember, a lot of those tech companies in the first few years, people were trying to work out how they were valued so high. Right. I joined the internet industry in 1999, so 20 years ago. And CPM was what it was all about. And it was run by old-fashioned media guys. Yeah. And I was not a media guy. I was a marketing guy. I joined BMC Media, which, which represented... Um, 
uh, Olympics.com and Telstra.com and ASX.com.au, a lot of big, big websites. So we're out there looking for, for advertising. And they brought me on to say, well, hang on, we can not just do advertising, we can do marketing programs. What a concept using the power and the traffic of these websites. So it was very much, and it still is in, in many cases that I can see, a CPM-based model where mm. you're getting a cost per thousand. Yeah, but Peter, what about when it was called interactive media? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. yeah and that was about engaging people on a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So while it may have been CPM, it seems that the only discussion now is CPM or media-based, yeah. yeah. where there was a time where the promise of this technology was to be able to do direct marketing in real time, to actually respond, or, or even if you want to call it direct sales. Well, I think if we can, if I can say something slightly controversial, I think um, developing the theme you were mentioning about the platforms needing to scale, such as the Googles and the, and the Facebooks, I think the the digital marketing party has been hijacked by these platforms, and we as marketers have been suckered in because of the vast audiences that they offer, and we and we all use them and leverage them, and that's and that makes complete sense. But it has diverted our gaze away from the main game, which is customer of one times a million. Mm. as opposed to a million. Well, because it also explains why when Facebook can turn around and tell everyone they've deleted almost a billion fake accounts mm. and no one bats an eyelid, no. which is bizarre because if you're buying a CPM and almost half the customers have been fake up to now, yep. you would say half your CPM is wasted. Well, that's right. And but if you were doing proper direct marketing, it didn't matter because you probably right. weren't targeting a fake account. You are targeting people that you'd identified as genuine prospects. I've done campaigns uh, for a major FMCG brand, and we did a national account-specific consumer promotion, online promotion, and I think we got 5,000 5, entries. Not many. And as I say, this is an X hundred million dollar brand. And they achieved, and there wasn't, basically they did exactly the same national account specific campaign in Woolworths uh, the year before, but the only difference this year was that the year I was working on it was what we did from a digital point of view, which was email marketing, which was really drilling down and, and getting to know the customers and marketing them individually at 5,000 entries only. During that two months that we ran that national account specific promotion, they achieved the highest market share they had ever had. Mm. in Woolworths and what of course then the then the, the switch gets turned off and goes back to normal and it's price 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 it's interesting you should say that because I remember a uh, an insurance company contacted us and this is you know a decade ago saying what's the benchmark for uh, direct mail response and I said well there's no real benchmark I mean the industry throws some numbers around but you know, a better question is, why are you asking? Oh, well, you know, we've just noticed our uh, high 400,000 high value customers. Yeah. Well, it's dropped from about 1.5 to about 0.9% response rate. And, and we're wondering why. And I said, that must be really concerning. He goes, oh, yeah, it is a little bit. And I go, no, no. The fact that almost, well, over 99% of your high value customers are actively rejecting your brand. Yeah. And he went, what do you mean? And I go, you do realize that if you, if I mailed, let's say, 100 invitations to a party, mm. to my friends, and 99 of them didn't respond, I would feel rejected. Yep. And yet you're telling me that a response rate of 0.9% is absolutely okay with you. That's you're right. a bit concerned, but it's okay. He went, oh, I hadn't thought of it like that. Continuing that party thing, because this is one of my favorite ways of explaining what it's all about. And it really comes down to this focus on, on platforms and technology as opposed to the people. I say to people, it's like throwing this amazing party. You get the catering, you get the music, you get the tent and the, and the chair covers and everything is fabulous. And everything's in readiness until you actually realize, hang on, I forgot to invite anyone. <laughs> And that's exactly what's happening in digital marketing today. We're focusing on so much stuff and we're outsourcing, as we always used to do, the audience thing to platforms such as Google and Facebook. And that makes sense on a number of levels. And we certainly do that as well in what we do. But it comes down to then what? 
It's like it's like in the book in the, in my book Customer Romance, which sounds like a plug, but it's not. But it really, the premise is you got to keep showing up. Mm. When I give uh, presentations at conferences, one of my one of my favorite things is to is to find an unsuspecting lady in the audience who I think is going to be a good sport, and and going to her and saying, "Imagine you and I were going out." And we were having a fabulous time. We'd go to the theatre, we'd go bike rides, we'd go on holidays. We were having so much fun and we were in love. And then one day I got down on bended knee, candlelight dinner, the violins, and said, darling, I love you. Would you marry me? And then I'd say to the lady in the audience, what would you say? Hopefully she's a good enough sport to say yes. And then she'll say, what about my husband? It's like, don't worry about him. <laughs> but she'll say yes. And then I say to them as the kind of the, the clincher, and what would you then say if I didn't actually contact you for the next six months, for the next 12 months? Mm. Would you think I would still, you would still consider that you would be still engaged to me? And she'd say, no, of course not. But that's what we marketers are doing all the time. We've got a, sh the short termism of marketing is so alarming on one hand, but it's exciting on the other hand. So if you get a database of, 5,000 people or people, X, X 100,000 people who are coming to your website, the opportunity for you to engage with those people on an ongoing basis and delight them is vast because so many other marketing organizations, brands, companies don't do it. I think this is something that we've touched on previously in our conversations, which is the focus in marketing on acquisition. Yes. Because marketers will often find themselves measuring the number of new customers, but rarely measuring the value of those customers over time. How many times have you seen reports of, oh, we acquired an extra 50,000 customers, but no one's reporting on the 30,000 that just walked out the back door? That's right, the churn factor. Because as we have discussed before, so many marketers like the shiny new thing. We're creative souls at heart. We like the new. And that's great. And acquisition is important because obviously no matter how good a service you're providing, there's always going to be a churn. So there is, acquisition is still an important thing. But I would, I would say that retention is, what's the stats? Five, six, seven, eight times more profitable to keep a customer than it is to, to get a new customer. That's where, you, that's where you make money. That's where you get rich. I wonder if part of that is the fact that People think because marketing is about driving awareness, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, that's only part of the marketing of equation, but for a lot of companies, they think of their marketing department as the awareness, and that once they've got the customer through the door, that somehow sales, operations, all the other parts will keep the customer you know, in and being loyal, when in actual fact, it doesn't work that way. And one of my bugbears is how many times I've received a offer for a credit card from my own credit card company telling me that if I move my credit card, which is already with them, to them, I'll get interest free for 12 months. And I'm there going, you're trying to acquire me as a new customer. I'm an existing customer. That's right. And you're giving me an offer that when I phone up and go, I'd like my credit card interest free for 12 months, they go, oh, it's not for existing customers. And I go, but you sent me this piece of communication. And that's and you're a second-class citizen because you've had yeah. the temerity to be giving you, them your business and your money over a number of years. But it's like the, the, the new customers, they're the ones that get the rewards. I started my career as a, a grocery FMCG marketer. So I was, one of my first loves is, uh, is grocery marketing. And I, I always think that grocery marketers have some of the biggest marketing budgets in Australia, if not the world, as we know, but they squander it. There's so few market FMCG companies that understand this value of a customer of one. And I always think that one of the biggest misses that these people have, they're always whinging about the duopoly in Australia of Coles Woolworths, and now Aldi's come along for on a, on a lesser scale from a, a branding point of view. And they're saying, these bastards at the, at the supermarkets, they're taking us for granted, they're charging us all this co-op advertising and trading terms and we can't make a dollar and they're squeezing us out for their own brands. Well, funny that. Guess what they've done better than you guys? They've got customers. They've got loyal customers who are coming in the door. But they're, they're making us cut our price. Okay, well, why don't you have an insert in your packet? Why don't you have something printed on your packet where it says, send us an email or go to this website and get this and get that and form a direct relationship with X hundred thousand, X million of your customers, and then 
next time you go to the supermarket because you're still going to deal with them because mm. you're not going to be you're not well the distribution is what they've the distribu- got that's right they've got the distribution but they've also got the audience yeah so what i'm saying is yes they're always going to have the audience and also the, the shelves but why don't you have the audience as well so when you go and speak to coles and Woolworths, why don't you as a result of being intelligent enough to actually leverage the fact that you've got the, your consumers, millions of your consumers have your product in their hands on an ongoing basis. Why don't you collect that? Just a simple email. Email still works. It's like the, the stats show that for $1 invested, email on, on average returns $44. Why don't you build up a database of a quarter of a million of your consumers? And so next time you go and speak to the buyer at Woolworths, You'll say, yes, I need to give you this co-op advertising and I'll do this. But I've also got a database of 250,000 people and we can drive people into your store in addition to what we're doing. At the very least, it gives you more leverage than you have currently because you're going in cap in hand because they're the ones with the distribution. But more importantly, they're the ones with the audience. Why don't you have the audience? Mm. And that's that's a principle I don't see. I see very few of any marketers having. I have seen quite a few uh, FMCG, consumer packaged goods clients, that have tried to go into Mm, e-commerce, right? And they do it because they think that that's the way literally to circumvent the retailer and build a relationship because they always see the retailer as the barrier. Mm. They see it as the barrier to the customer. They use mass media as a way of talking at the customer. They'll say two, but at the customer. They'll go to the retailer. So they talk about consumer being the end user and customer being the retailer. Mm. And then they come along and they set up an e-commerce site and then they wonder why it doesn't work. Crickets. Yeah. Crickets there. Yeah. And, and then they go, oh, for all that effort, all I've managed to do is piss off my customer because the retailer goes, right. why are you competing with me? I want to be in this as a partnership. You supply the product, I sell the product. You know? that's, the, that's the point with direct marketing. Back in the, back in the old days... They the good old days. The good old days. No, these are the good old days. What are you talking about, Darren? The, day, the old days. One of the, the comments that often came by about, uh, about direct marketing is you didn't know what anyone else was doing. You didn't know who was sending the letters to, your cust- to, to their customers and what, what offers they were sending out. So the point is... Marketers can almost by stealth create these huge assets, databases and, and traffic to their website and in, do it in an, in an integrated way. And even apps, getting subscribers to your apps. So, so you can still take advantage of the technology. Technology is critical. But create those relationships and then leverage them. Because at the moment, you're still using the old mentality of it's like, I'm going to advertise on 60 Minutes Court or a current affair because they've got a million people who are, watching, who are going to watch my ad. Well, they're off at the loo or they're making a cup of tea or doing well, God knows what else. So, but the point is, yes, some people are going to see it, but it's real old paradigm thinking. Create your own media. Again, this is not a new principle. It's not my principle, but it's so rarely done. It's, mm. it's alarming. Go, sorry, going back to FMCG with regards to um, companies or FMCG companies. I know Nestle was always one of the, one of the innovators when it came to creating those those individual relationships. I don't know Lester Wonderman actually had Nestle as a client many, many years ago. So I remember they, they did some really funky things. I'm not sure what they're doing here in Australia or if they're still having that focus, but they certainly were, were innovators in that role, as was Kimberly Clark with, uh, with Huggies. Well, and one of the other things that uh, consumer packaged goods can do is actually invest in content marketing. Correct. To actually use that as a way of building the relationship because, you know, the, a lot of products have stories to tell or uh, usage, you know, the old, if you're selling food, sell the recipe that mm. uses the food. And the know. experiences associated with that food. In fact, I think it was actually Nestle in the US. One of their best direct marketing pieces was a regular cookbook that used all of their products mm. in the cookbook. And uh, they, well, they worked out the return on investment using coupons right. in, the, in the cookbook. And it was like the best ROI of right. any activity. Darren, this is the thing. Direct marketing is not complicated. We're marketers. We're not exactly splitting the atom here, as I always say to my team. This is simple stuff. 
but the principles that are often forgotten because the attention is taken away in in meeting in, in going through the process of building the website or doing the TVC or meeting with the media agency and often this single-minded focus on the customer and creating those individual customer relationships times a thousand times ten million is forgotten in the rush to get everything done and it's like okay well again it's this short-termism that infects so much of, of marketing these days which is really astounding because we have so many more tools than we did 10 15 20 years ago it's so it's it's the golden age for marketers and quite frankly it should also be the golden age for customers but it's not and i wonder if it's because the technology has actually obscured the strategy yes and people are getting caught up in that but there is a shining light because you know i've done uh, uh, had discussions with uh, people in media like Martin Cass at uh, MDC Media Partners and Scott Hagedorn at uh, Hearts and Sciences, where they're starting to use uh, data, customer data, as a way of making media choices. So it's no longer media choices around just reaching mass. Mm. They're actually looking for media that indexes much higher for the very specific customers that they've already Mm. got as a way of deciding then no, it's not the lowest cost per thousand. Mm. It's about indexing higher so that you build relationships through media, which is a very direct marketing approach. Very, it? and it's a wonderful, wonderful to hear that. But there's, there are always going to be uh, the people uh, shouting against the, 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 the mass. And I think that's wonderful. That who, however many people there are that have these types of uh, positions of being able to form those customer relationships and leverage them over a period of time. As I say, it's great for customers great for the brand mm. but often it, it kind of gets obscured by the, the the mass the majority who are still going down the old advertising ethos of let's just stack them high watch them fly and let's just hope that it hope that it works and one of the problems with that traditional model is wastage correct That's because right. when you cast the net as wide as possible the danger is that your actual customers or potential customers in there could be relatively small. That's right. And and that's that's something that the marketers have always accepted. Mm. Always accepted. And it's like, look, obviously there's not digital's not the the, the 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 magic bullet where that doesn't happen. But there's always wastage in, in marketing. I always say that marketing is about the increment. If you can take thirty if what you're doing is at thirty three point six eight percent and make it thirty four point six eight percent, you're winning. You're ahead. So it's not, you're never going to get 100% of the people. That's just unrealistic. But it's like if you can actually... Even in, in a monopoly, you'll never well, get... Well, that's right, exactly. You'll never get 100% because there'll still be people that reject you. That's right, because you're a, a monopoly. monopoly. yeah. So it's like, where? what are the opportunities are? Right? It's like, can you just... It's the incremental advantages and opportunities you can take that you can really um, leverage in a way that, that other people are not doing. As I said, one of the biggest... Uh, I'm using this word at the moment, one of the biggest opportunities for marketers is to really see, I'm not doing this as a brand, as an organization, but one of the the greatest exciting things is invariably my competitors are not doing it either. So if you actually have a, a much more refined, direct marketing focus on the customer, and then as I say, leverage the media, the sorry, the the technology yeah. to times a thousand, times a million, that's where you can get the results. Now, just to go back to your book, this subtitle, mm-hmm. you know, because it's customer romance, and then the subtitle, How to Build Your Brand One Customer at a Time, right. is really uh, interesting for me because we have a conversation a lot with marketers. When we do uh, marketing restructures, mm-hmm. you know, there's always this group called the brand team, mm-hmm. right? And my point is that there's a need to define the brand. But the the need to actually communicate the brand in bespoke pieces of communication is actually diminishing over time because brand is actually built not through telling people what your brand is, but by creating customer experiences that create the brand for the customer, isn't it? Absolutely. And this is where... And is that what you mean here in the book? Exactly. So it's like, it's... My experience is going to be different to your experience. Mm. And a, a smart brand will give their consumers and customers the latitude to be able to do that because I am a different person. I have different needs, fears, desires than you do. So it's a question of as long as I can do that 
in the context of using this shirt or or driving this car or buying this television, that's what it's all about. And obviously, technology can help us to target our messages, our communication, our experiences to each individual customer's needs. Now, someone may be listening to this and saying, this is completely unrealistic. If I'm Telstra or if I'm Westpac and I have 10 million customers, how's that going to work? Well, it's going to work. It's going to work because, as I say, we have tools and we have the ability to, to really silo customer, customers like we never had before. As you said, back in the old back in the old days, the direct marketing days, you'd have a typing pool, this vast typing pool, typing out all these letters to these individuals. We don't need to do that anymore. We can do it electronically. What a concept. Mm. So I think that's where the opportunity is to really, as I say, hone in on what those customers' needs are. And as I say, it might sound outlandish. It's like, well, hang on. I've got this brand that's been used, that's been around for 50 years. People trust it. They love it. Um, we do price promotion. We, we update the packaging or we, we do um, events if we're, like a, a, we're a software type of, uh, type of brand. So we've got this nail. Thank you very much. Well, do you? Really? Well, it's interesting that the brands you chose you know, are brands that if you went to the consumer and said, name a telco, name a bank, you would think that they'd have very high unprompted awareness. Yes. You know, Telstra's, Westpac's, right? So the role of brand to raise awareness, you know, if you're already up in the 90s, what's the role, 90% of people say, mm. you know, saying that they would name you as an unprompted telco or an unprompted bank? What are you actually doing brand communications for? When, how many times have you seen a new big brand campaign launch and the promise of the communication is totally different to the customer experience. Well, that's right. And, and as I say, unfortunately, the telcos are a classic, and banks are a classic example of that. The, because nothing stays the same. The old cliche, the only constant is change. If you don't look after the brand, if you don't look after the relationship, the brand and the relationship goes away. Again, going back to the book, it's like if we, if we don't talk to someone for six months, as is often the case, because our budget's been uh, been exhausted, we ha- we're going to speak to them again, and we're going to take that up in six months' time when the when the new financial year starts, and then we can start talking to them again. Well, hang on, <laughs> customers aren't sitting there waiting for you to send them their piece of information, that communication. They're actually sitting there thinking, hey, hang on, your competitors have, have hit up, hit on me. I really like the blog post they've done. I like that viral video that they've done, and so, and, and combined with all of that, I like the offer. And what they have to offer me, I'm going, well, then see you later, alligator. And that's and they wonder why there's churn. So it's not just I've got 90% brand, 90 plus percent um, name recognition for my brand. It's a whole lot of other factors, which, as I say, it's almost like it's mind mapping and whiteboarding exactly what the what you should be doing with your customers. It's not simple, obviously, when you're talking about these these multifaceted organizations, it's it's complicated. But as I say, we as marketers and communicators and persuaders have so many more tools and ways and means to engage with and win over customers' hearts and minds than we ever did before. The challenge in the problem and the opportunity is that most marketers don't haven't thought deeply enough in my experience, and maybe I'm, I'm just having tickets on myself, they haven't thought deeply enough about this to actually say, well, hang on, it's not just about a Facebook page. It's not just about a database. It's not just about a TVC. It's about what do I mean to my customers? How can I make it more meaningful? So this lady who's used this product and it actually did incredible things, I should be telling the world about that because it's going to champion her. It's going to show how wonderful she is, but it's also going to show other people, hang on, these are people who this this lady has is putting her money where your mouth is. Mm. So she's not just this actor. Who's this? They've invested in your brand. That's right. And They're, what's their return on that investment? That's exactly. What's the return on their emotional investment? investment? Not to mention financial. financial fit, yeah. And that's where it's so. It, it's that's that's the great stuff. That's the that's the good stuff where you can actually say, "Wow, this stuff actually works." It's not just a bar of soap. It's not just a brand of sneakers. Look at Nike talking about sneakers. Look at Under Armour. How did yeah. Under Armour sneak under the wire, so to speak? Yeah. How did they become such a major brand? when they already have the Nikes and the Adidas and, and, and these major brands that are already there. 
they understood the power of influences, I think. That was a very big part of what they were doing. Was their product better? Probably not. I don't know enough about the, the Under Armour story, but the point is they manage to engage with people more effectively. That's why there's always an opportunity. There's these shifting sands of opportunity for marketers to come in there and to swoop and to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to come in and demonstrate to customers and potential customers that I care more than the people you're working with. And that's where you win new business and you keep new business, keep business from customers ongoing. Uh, I've just noticed the time because we, uh, could, we could keep doing this for hours. I can imagine exactly. that so much more to explore. But yeah. thanks, Peter. Thanks for uh, Darren, coming pleasure. and sitting down and having a chat. You're getting me all excited. I don't know what to do now. I'm going to walk around the block. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one last question. Do you see a time when direct marketing will now be talked about as a part of the overall marketing strategy? 